There are a lot of other minyanim opened, so they're going now. Why is a lot of minyanim opened? No, because, well, it's we won't talk about it here. <laughs> okay. Give it one second, we'll start, okay? Okay, okay. My, my son's not around tonight, so no jingle. <clears throat> Good luck, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. Rabbi Kolobach is going to take us through the life story of the Rebbe's wife. <clears throat> but uh, before I introduce you, before Rabbi Kolobach comes on, I just want to make mention that last week Rabbi Kolobach spoke about the importance of Yechidus, of seeing the Rebbe privately. And uh, the Rebbe explained after the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe passed away, that you went to a Rebbe for a bracha for health, a bracha for, sust, for, for wealth, a bracha for children. If God forbid somebody messed up in life, you went to see a Rebbe. And the Rebbe explained after the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe passed away that you could do all of that by going to the oil and uh, visiting the oil of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. In fact, uh, during the 50 years that the Rebbe was, during from 19... 50 until 1992, the Rebbe went to the oil very often. When I was in Yeshiva, he went twice a month, and towards the end of the Rebbe's life, he went almost every day. But be that as it may, next Sunday at 5 p.m., Rabbi Kolobach is going to do, be doing a virtual visit to the oil. So anybody who would like to experience this, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. We've done two or three of them before, and they've been very well attended, and uh, it's a very special thing to do. So WhatsApp's going to go out. If anybody's interested to join, please let us know. But uh, I'm going to pass it to Rabbi Kolobach now for, for, to hear about the Rebetzin's life. Thank you, Rabbi Mesinta, for that introduction. And we hope that people will join us on the virtual visit to the Ohel and that they will receive the blessings they need. A good vach to everybody. Tonight, we have the very unique opportunity of discussing some of the life of Rebetzin Chaya Mushke, who was the wife of our beloved Rebbe, the second daughter of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, and obviously the granddaughter of the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, and so on. Through her lifetime, she was a very private individual. Very few people knew who she was or what she was. And that includes even those in the Chabad community. For example, I was in New York from 1970 to 1980. And According to my recollection, I only remember seeing the Rebetzin once, in fact, at a petrol station, interestingly enough. But one could get a sense of who she was by watching our Rebbe. That first Kaddish he said at the funeral is one of the most heartbreaking things to hear and to see how broken the Rebbe was and the great honor and respect he gave to the Rebetzin. How for the whole year of her mourning, he basically moved out of 770 and uh, moved the shul and all to her home. And uh, for the whole Shiva and thereafter, the Minyanim and his work would take place from his home. There were many things that actually stopped after the Rebetzin passed away, including uh, weekday fabrengens, mamorim, 
he would give a few sikhs here and there, but that stopped and one could see the great effect that the passing of the Rebetzin had on our Rebbe and how it, it actually affected his health and, and many other things to get a little glimpse into what an amazing person she was. And since her passing in 1988, as we'll be discussing, many, many stories and many things came out about the Rebetzin. And perhaps I could give a few words of introduction before we go into her life and some of the stories about her the inspiration and lessons that some of them anyway, that we can take from her life to improve our own. Do you know there's a Talmudic statement that says, whoever chases honor, respect, or notice, honor will run away from them. And uh, if you run away from honor, honor will chase you. They tell a story of a guy who came to his rabbi and he said, I'm always running away from honor, yet honor never seems to be chasing me. How do you explain the words of that Talmudic statement? And the rabbi answered, honor knows when you're peeking to see if it's chasing you. It is a natural thing for people to have egos, to want to be noticed, to want to be sure that they leave the right impression that people take note of them, whether it is well-deserved or not. The Rebetzin truly was a person who truly ran away from honor, as we'll discuss in some of the stories. And Baruch Hashem, the Rebbe made sure that honor chased her and that her life would become known, evaluated and appreciated in at least a little bit of a degree because there is obviously so much that we will never ever know about her greatness. One of the things that everybody who has ever been in her presence describes is how regal, malchustic, how royalty she was. She truly was a Jewish queen. They say she may have been short in, in height, but she was certainly large in stature. When she walked in, she commanded a room. And one of the beautiful things that she shared with the Rebbe was that when you came to her, she didn't focus on herself. She didn't tell you stories about herself. She focused on you, made you comfortable and was able in a few questions to find out everything she wanted about you. And she was comfortable with every age, from a two-year-old, five-year-old, teenager, bar mitzvah, to a kala, to every age. She knew how to get through to them, to make them comfortable in her presence. One example I was told was, I think it was uh, Rabbi Shmulu's family that would come to the Rebetzin as a result of the Rebbe's closeness to his in-laws, Rabbi Zalman Yafi. And they were quite a band of children that would come in and the Rebetzin was cutting cake to give them. She was extremely hospitable. And the five-year-old pipes up and says, I'd like to cut the cake myself. And there was a uh, embarrassed silence because obviously that wouldn't do. The Rebetzin without meeting, be, missing a beat, 
turned to him and said, do you know what? If you cut yourself a cake, piece of cake, it'll be quite small. Let me do it. And I'll give you a much bigger piece than you're expecting. He was only too happy to receive the bigger piece of cake. That was the way her sensitivity was to small children and older. But let us begin at the beginning, as they say, with the Rebetzin's life. She was born on the 25th of Adar, 1901, which, by the way, would make her a little older uh, by one year of the Rebbe, who was born on the 11th of Nisan in 1902. So that's uh, about 12 and a half months later. Her family, her parents, lived then in Lubavitch together with the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe. He was not in, in Lubavitch at the time. And she was born in a place near Lubavitch, I guess there were no hospitals there, in a place called Babinovich. And the Rebbe Rashab sent a telegram when she was born saying that if you have not na yet named your daughter, please name her Chaya Mushka after the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitch Rebbe's wife. It's interesting to note that the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, as we've discussed many times, his name was Rav Menachem Mendel. And so to the seventh Rebbe in Rebetzin, a Rebbe has the same name as the Tzemach Tzedek, and the Rebetzin Chaya Mushka had the same name as the Tzemach Tzedek's wife. They also had much in common, by the way, including the fact that the Tzemach Tzedek's wife predeceased the Tzemach Tzedek as well. And there too, there was a large impact and a very big effect. And much of what the Tzemach Tzedek was doing in his Nesias while his Rebetzin was alive, he stopped doing it similar to our Rebbe. When in 1915, the Rebbe Rashab moved with his family to Rostov and Don, running away from Lubavitch. Lubavitch was the seat of the Lubavitch Rebbe's from 1815, when the Mittler Rebbe settled there after the um, war between Russia and Napoleon, the Alt Rebbe passing away in 1812. In 1815, he made Lubavitch his home and it remained that way till 1917, when the Rebbe Rashab left for Rostov. The Rebbe Rashab, towards the end of his life, was not well. And um, when the Rebetzin was 19 years old, that would be base in 1920, the Rebbe Rashab was sick for quite a few weeks uh, before that. He didn't tell any of his family. The only one he confided in was our Rebetzin, this 19-year-old granddaughter. In fact, using her to quietly and secretly get medicines for him. And she kept his confidence. She looked after him. And uh, she spent nights attending to the Rebbe Rashab's uh, needs. In fact, later they tell that uh, when a nigun was sung, she would say that was one of the nigunim that my grandfather, the Rebbe Rashab, uh, really loved. As we know, the previous Rebbe became Rebbe in 1920 with the passing of his father. And that was an extremely trying time for Jews in Russia. Uh, because the previous Rebbe single-handedly took up the fight and the struggle against the Yevsexia, the Jewish communists, and um, doing secret undercover work 
with spreading Torah through yeshivas, through Talmud Torahs, through mikvois, and having all the shluchim. Obviously, the previous Rebbe needed certain people he can trust. And one of the close confidants and close people that worked with him hand in hand was his daughter, Rebbe Chaya Mushka. She was only in her 20s, but the previous Rebbe involved her in his work and recognized the great wisdom she had and the inner strength. In fact, the, she was often asked to secretly transport food and supplies to the Lubavitch Yeshiva. There was also the Navardic, a very famous Navardic Yeshiva there at the time. She was also asked to deliver food. And they knew that as a woman, she would not be uh, open to the same scrutiny as a man would, and because she was such a wise woman, she would know um, how, how to get out of things. We see in the documents that she, when she was only 23, the previous Rebbe was then living in, a, in Leningrad, and he signed the document of a power of attorney, giving her the full rights to receive monies on his behalf, to, to give out monies. He trusted her to such a degree. When the Rebbe Rash, uh, the previous Rebbe, was arrested and the Avsekzia came into the apartment, they asked the daughters, to which party do they belong? The Communist Party, this party, and she bravely answered that we belong to our father's party, which is not a political party at all. It's a religious party. And the bravery that she showed actually made the previous Rebbe afraid that she would get into trouble as a result. That night, when the previous Rebbe was arrested, we are told that the Rebbe, who was her chassan at the time, uh, they were engaged to be married and he was approaching the flat and she knew what trouble could be caused by it. She put her head out the window and shouted out to him, Schneerson, we have guests. The Rebbe understood the hint. He quickly hurried to some of the secretaries in places where the previous Rebbe had many documents that could have been incriminating and helped them get uh, rid of it. And um, they had to wait because of the um, arrest of the previous Rebbe, even though they were engaged, they would only get married on the 14th of Kislev in 1928, Tofresh Peites in Warsaw. It's interesting to note that after the previous Rebbe was released from his jail and from giving the death sentence, he was originally sent into exile to Kastrama. And there was a chassid uh, who accompanied him, but together he asked his daughter to come with him to accompany him. In 1929, as I mentioned, they were living in Riga, but the wedding was in Warsaw. They went back to Riga, and there the Rebetzin was surrounded by her family, extended family, friends, and her whole lifestyle. The Rebbe felt that what he had to do was go to a place away from the Hasidim, uh, for reasons I don't know if any of us will ever understand, but certainly to serve God and to, to, to uh, grow in whatever way he wanted to, more in privacy, and also to attend university courses, etc. as we discuss when we'll discuss the Rebbe. And 
his Rebetzin willingly accompanied him, giving up everything. So in 1929, they moved to Berlin. After spending, they would come back to the Rebbe for Yom Tifs. And by the way, we see much correspondence how the Rebbe was still involved even in, in Berlin and when he'd go to France with everything of the Friedrich Rebbe. We see in the letters how the Rebbe, previous Rebbe would entrust our Rebbe, sending him articles about from Hatomim and other uh, aspects of Mamorim, but that's for time when we discuss the Rebbe. Let's get back to the Rebbetson. She <coughs> gave up everything. And in fact, she took courses to the, together with the Rebbe and would often help him in his homework and in the work that he was doing in the university. In 1933, Hitler came to power and the Rebbe and Rebetzin saw that things were very dire in Germany. I remember at Fabrengens, he would even speak, the Rebbe would speak about what he witnessed there when the Nazis, Yemach Shemam, came to power and they ran to Paris. In Paris, he uh, registered to university from which he got a degree in engineering, I think also uh, uh, naval engineering, as the Rebbe would take a job later in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in the years of the war. They say because he didn't want to earn his living in Avedis HaKodesh, but rather to make a living. And she went uh, with him. She also studied there and got degrees as well. In 1940, when the Nazis invaded France, there was a Marshal Philip Patin who set up a different government in Vichy, France, and the Rebbe and Rebetzin moved to Nice. During that time, she tells a couple of stories to people later. One of the stories she tells is that she witnessed a bombardment and she saw uh, shells coming for a certain Jewish man. And she pushed him to the ground, which saved his life. And she later said, true, I saved his life. But for pushing a Jew, I have to repent. I have to do teshuva. And there are many stories told about her life in France, the sacrifices she made, the hospitality that the Rebbe and she showed. Um, but uh, in 1941, they managed to get on one of the last boats, if not the last, that left Europe. It was the Serpa Pinto. And they left from Marseille to Lisbon, Portugal, and from there to New York. They arrived on uh, Tess. Uh, they arrived in 1941. Our Rebbe was quite hidden, and the Rebetzin. They uh, took up residence in a apartment uh, building. And um, we jump now to 1950. In 1950, when her father passed away, Arebe was very, very reluctant and kept refusing to accept becoming Rebbe. Amongst the reasons that are given is because he knew what effect it would have and what impact it would have on his wife. He knew how much, how many hours a day, seven days a week, he would be involved with public, public work, not having any time. Unfortunately, sadly, they were not blessed with any children. 
his wife would basically be left all alone. And he was real, that is one of the reasons they give for his reluctance to accept becoming Rebbe. And it was the Rebbetzin who turned to the Rebbe and said, I'm imploring you to accept becoming Rebbe. Even though she was the daughter of the Rebbe, obviously, she knew what it meant. She said, if you don't take it up, then all the work that my father put in for all these years and his ancestors will be for naught. You are the only one who can take this forward. And when you think about the fact that in 1950, when the Rebbe was Rebbe, anybody who has been to 770 and seen the small shul there, it's maybe enough for 60 people, 70 people. And that shul was not even full. When the previous Rebbe Fabrengt, there was just a few tables. Uh, and and um, many Hasidim had been killed or stayed in, in Europe during the war. Lubavitch was extremely small community. And it was at the Rebetzin's urging and recognizing what her husband would be able to do that she urged her husband to become the seventh Lubave Cherebe as, as he did. As I said, the sacrifices that she made for the, for the Rebbe and being Rebbe is something that probably most people could never appreciate. But we get a certain glimpse into how proud and what a relationship they had. She would tell people who had come to her uh, with pride when the Rebbe made his campaigns, his mitzvah campaigns, when the Rebbe made the tanks, he would say, what do you think, she would say, of my husband's innovations. Isn't, aren't they clever? Aren't they great? And she took tremendous pride, not only in being the, in, in her husband, the Rebbe, but the love and devotion that she had for the Rebbe is something amazing. One of the people she confided in was, uh, Rebetzin Hadassah Karlbach. She is a, a cousin of mine once removed. She was married to Eliechaim Karlbach. Uh, that's the famous Shlomo's twin brother. And I heard personal stories from her about her time with the Rebetzin because the Rebetzin had some close friends and confidants. And one of them was Rebetzin Hadassah Kalbach, who grew up in, in France. And uh, her father was Rabbi Zalman Schneerson. And so they were also cousins. But while the Rebetzin was in France, they had a connection. And he told, she told Hadassah Kalbach that she never, ever, um, allowed the Rebbe to come home to a dark room, what we to a dark house. What we have to understand that is that um, the, the Rebbe's schedule was, was immense. There wasn't one day of the time that he was Rebbe that he wasn't in the office working. In the early years, he had three times a week yechidis, a personal audience. And um, that is, he would come home sometimes three o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it was already light outside. And the Rebetzin told Hadassah, that she always waited up for the Rebbe. Her husband 
should not should come home to a, a dark house and a cold supper to be eaten alone was simply not an option. And uh, the Rebetzin went to extraordinary um, measures to ensure that her husband would always come home to a haven of peace, tranquility, and support. Um, and she gave up her husband. In Europe, she had a very large family network, a support group, which she didn't have in America, but she was ready to make all those sacrifices so that the life of others would be improved and the world could be bettered. Uh, moving fast forward, and I'll get back to some stories afterwards. Um, she wasn't well for quite a few times in between. And um, one of the things was she never ever wanted to give her husband, the Rebbe, any agmas nefesh, any worry or anguish over her health. So usually she kept that hidden. In fact, a story is told one of the people she was close to was a Rabbi Zalman Gerari Oliver Shalom. And her, his daughter, by the way, is Rebetzin Esther Sternberg, who was in, is in charge of the Neshek, the whole Shabbos, uh, the Friday night lighting candle uh, campaign. She also stood by the Rebbe, when the, Rebbe, when the girls would stop by for dollars, I'll tell you a little story about her as well, and the, and, and the Rebetzin. So she once needed some eye treatment, and they gave her two options to choose which one. And she phoned Zalman Garari and said, I'm not sure which to take. So which do you think, which option should I go for? And Zalman Garai told the Rebetzin, Rebetzin, I don't understand. Why don't you ask your husband, the Rebbe? After all, thousands of people um, go to him for advice. Why don't you ask him? And she answered, I don't want to discuss it with my husband because it'll cause him pain and anguish. So I'd rather keep it from him and come to the conclusion myself. He said, let me think about it. And in turn, he contacted the Rebbe and gave the options and told the story. And um, the Rebbe told uh, Zalman Garari which, to which ad way to advise the Rebetzin. And he also added, please don't tell the Rebetzin that you asked me and that I gave you that advice so that it doesn't cause her the anguish of knowing that I know about it. Um, the Rebetzin, as I say, was an extremely regal, welcoming person. And she was brought up, as you know, in the Hasidic home. And that reflected so much of her life. One cute story that I remember hearing was from a Yossel Katzman. He's a public speaker today. And he tells that once, I don't remember which shop, whether he was at the Lipsker shop or whatever, he was asked to deliver some groceries to the Rebetzin's house, which he did. He rang the bell and the Rebetzin herself actually answered and said, uh, one minute, I would like to give you something for making the delivery. I think he, he, she brought him a beautiful bar of chocolate and he was a little embarrassed. So he said in Yiddish, Rebetzin, ich bin gehovd, in ach stub. 
I was brought up in a Hasidic home. And in that Hasidic home, I was taught to do things for its own value and not to accept tips. To which the Rebetzin smiled and said, Ich bin ich gehodavit geworden in a Hasidic Stub. Und ich hab ge gelernt as Megit Nemtman. She answered, I was also brought up in a Hasidic home, being brought up obviously in her father's home. And she said, and I was taught, if you offered, accept. And she pressed it on him. One of the, um, the uh, people who worked in her home was a Rabbi Mendel Nottick. He calls himself not a, a rabbi. And uh, many of these stories I'm going to share with you. <coughs> you can get them actually on, on the YouTube because they had a beautiful Fabrengen last week of the Rebetzin and people shared these stories. One of the stories that he tells is, we know that in 1977, Shmini Atzeres Tovshin Lamet Ches, the Rebbe had a heart attack. And before I go into that story, the Rebbetzin played a very important role in that whole thing. She had seen that her husband was pale, he hadn't eaten, he was standing on his feet the entire time, and she asked the office, please take more concern for, for, the, for my husband, try and get him to rest because he's not feeling that great. By the way, every day she would send with him a thermos of tea, I understand also some chocolate babka. And my uh, brother told me that there was a certain ice storm and he was learning in yeshiva and Rabbi Label Groner's son who was uh, learning with him in yeshiva. My brother was uh, could, could drive in those days, terrible ice storm. He called my brother and he said, come with me. And he took him and said, can you get the keys for, for a vehicle? We have to go to a certain bakery. And then he said that the Rebetzin used to send tea and coffee to the Rebbe every day. And that day she hadn't sent that uh, chocolate babka with, and she phoned the mosquitoes and said, please make sure that the Rebbe has his, uh, his nourishment. And so they, they went gladly. In the time of the attack, the doctors came to 770, they were called the cardiologists, they took the Rebbe's pulse and all, whatever it is that you take. And they said the Rebbe had a major heart attack. And it's a question of life and death. The Rebbe has to be in a hospital. His very life is in danger. The Rebbe refused to go. He said there'll be more fear for the Hasidim and he's not going. The doctor said, if he doesn't go, we're walking off the case. And the Rebetzin was then in, uh, was called and she came to 770 and the doctors told her, your husband's life is in danger. He refuses to go to the hospital. We only have one option left. And that is, we can sedate him with a shot and we'll put him to sleep and then he'll end up in the hospital and we could treat him and save his life. Now, when that was told to the secretariat and the elder Hasidim, not one of them knew what to do and they were in a quandary. The Rebetzin knew exactly what to do. She said, in all my life that I've been with the Rebbe, he has never not been in control. He knows exactly what he's doing and why he is doing. I will never agree 
to putting the sedating the Rebbe against his will. If my husband doesn't want to go to the hospital, he won't go. Even if you walk off and she refused to sign any, anything and she stood by her husband. And then Rabbi Krinsky relates, they didn't know what to do. And the Rebetzin walked into him and said, certainly you know of some doctor that you can call who could take care of my husband. And somehow he remembered a Dr. Iris, Ira Weiss, who was close to his brother-in-law, Rabbi Schusterman in Chicago. They called Rabbi Shush Schusterman incessantly on the night of Shmini Atzeres until he answered the phone. They got the call, the phone number of Dr. Ira Weiss, who was a from doctor, but he was ready to fly out on Yom Tif to see to the Rebbe. He also gave them another doctor to see to who was in New York. And he devoted months later to the Rebbe's health, giving up his whole practice. So, and then he went back to Chicago. The Rebbetson and Dr. Weiss used to talk very, very often. And the Rebbe also wanted him to check out the Rebbets in her heart and, and whatever problems he had. So Mendel Nottick says the phone calls between Ira Weiss and the Rebbets were quite frequent. By the way, in those days, the 70s and 80s, there were no cell phones. And so phone calls were quite, uh, even from New York to Chicago, they were called long distance calls. And the Rebbetson was always very careful with other people's money. And whenever, whenever he phoned, she would run to the phone and say, let me phone you back. And she was always very, very succinct with him because he wouldn't allow her to. And uh, he tried to be very short. So one day, Mendel Nottick is there and the phone rings and it's Dr. Ira Weiss on the other side. He didn't care, he says, about the cost. He was talking to him quite a while about what he had seen of the Rebbe and the Rebbetson, etc. And then he said he'd like to talk to the Rebbetson. So the Rebbetson was very close. And um, he went to her and he said, uh, there's a phone call for you. So he's, she said, who's on the phone? Is it Gansberg, guy who, who was in charge of working in the, in the Rebetzin's home? He said, no, it's Dr. Ira Weiss, but I'm sure you knew that because whenever anyone else phones, I'm always speaking to him in Yiddish. The only person I speak to in English on the phone is Dr. Ira Weiss. And certainly you heard me speaking to him, so you must have known. And her answer was that I um, learned from my father that when something is not my business, I can sit right there and not hear what they are saying. And so I didn't hear your conversation. This was the type of person that she, she was. To understand, as I said at the beginning, a little bit of the Rebetzin, there was uh, one Sunday morning, there was a guy by the name of Jules Lasner, who was extremely impressed. He had the, uh, the opportunity of visiting the Rebbe's wife, uh, the, the Rebetzin, and he was impressed by her warmth, hospitality, and the genuine interest she took in others. And when he passed by Sunday morning for a dollar, he summoned up for the courage and said, after meeting your wife, I understand the expression behind every great man is a great woman. And in fact, at her shiva, when one saw the grief that the Rebbe went through, um, someone 
asked him about the Rebetzin and also mentioned how great she was. And the Rebbe said, that's an understatement. No one but <coughs> uh, her creator will ever understand what she is. Uh, amongst the, the uh, stories that are told is uh, Rabbi Zarchi tells this story, by the way, that in 19 and Tovshin Lamet Ches, as, as mentioned, um, the Rebbe had his heart attack. Now, the Rebbe used to walk home every Friday night um, and uh, every Shabbos in the early years, he would walk himself to, to, uh, every day to, to, to Shul. One of the beautiful sights they tell that before 1964, on Vov Tishrei, when the Rebbe's mother passed away, was to watch the Rebbetzin, the Rebbe's wife, the Rebbe, and his mother walking back from the Pesach Seder, which was held in the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe's house on the second floor of 770. After the Seder, the three of them would walk together first to the Rebbe's mother's house on President Street, and then they would walk home. So <coughs> having the heart attack, the Rebbe wanted to preserve the Rebbe's energy. And they, the, those who know Nexus 770 is the Rebbe's library. It's a very big building. And in the downstairs in the basement, basically, they prepared a little living quarters, dining room and a bedroom, or whatever, for the Rebbe and Rebetzin to spend Shabbos and Yom Tov there together so he wouldn't have the trouble of walking home. But now it was Pesach. And the, the uh, place was full of chametz. So they were play. the Rebbe was planning to walk, but the Rebetzin didn't want that. She thought it was too, it would be too much of an exertion on the Rebbe. And they didn't know what to do. But she found, found out that the Zarchi has a very strong guy. So she they phoned somehow and asked if he can give his, his worker to them to clean the library. He was strong, efficient and everything. And he worked and in 24 hours, they got the library cleaned up. He says, you cannot understand how many times she thanked me, phoned me to thank me for what I, I did in presenting that and allowing the Rebbe to, to be able to be next door for Pesach. Um, he also tells a, a, a story that um, during the night, many times, generally, people would call the, the mosquitoes, the secretariat, uh, always to ask the Rebbe for, for brachas. But the secretariat's hours were as long as the Rebbe's hours were. And um, when the Rebbe went home, which was in the early hours of the morning when he had Yechidus, and uh, if it wasn't, then he'd go home at about 12, 1230. Um, then the secretariat wasn't working. And sometimes there would be a situation that it was a life and death uh, situation. And people had no choice, either they or they would ask a secretary to, to, to phone up. And Rabbi Zarchi says, didn't matter when it was at night, on the first ring, the Rebetzin would always answer the call. 
and the people would apologize and say, I'm so sorry for phoning at three in the morning or at this or that. Um, she always made people feel comfortable and uh, would tell them, please, it's a matter of life and death, I will ask the Rebbe. They knew, he says, that from four to six and from five to seven in the morning were the times that the Rebbe was sleeping and if possible, not to call others. One of the stories they tell is that in 1966 on a winter morning at about 3.30 a.m., the Rebbe had left his office and a woman frantically from the sec uh, se secretariat saying her little baby had just fallen and was badly hurt and in critical condition. The doctors were arguing which procedures to perform. She needed the Rebbe's blessing and advice. The Rebbe's secretary said it would have to wait till the morning and he'll consult with the Rebbe first thing after he arrived. She said, it's a matter of life and death. I need an answer now. The secretary decided to um, dial the Rebbe's house and he would apologize. On the first ring, as I say, the Rebbe's answered and said, Verret. And he gave his name and said, I'm sorry for calling so late. I know it's a chutzpah to call at such a late hour, but there's a lady in desperate need she says it's a matter of life and death. The Rebetzin answered, why are you asking forgiveness? On the contrary, my husband and I were sent to this world to serve people in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week. By you calling us, you are helping us fulfill our mission. And the person says, as deeply moving as the Rebbe's me Rebbetzin's message of sacrifice was, what struck him most is the unassuming delivery with which it was conveyed. Not only did she completely dedicate her life to others, she said, thank you for the opportunity. In her mind and heart, it wasn't she who was doing the favor. It was others who were helping her fulfill her mission. There are many people who sacrifice of themselves from others, but how many of them don't feel righteous about it? The Rebbe's wor the Rebbetzin's words weren't just selfless, but they reflected an utter abnegation of self. You know, one time the um, sent, Neshei Chabad sent a beautiful bouquet of flowers to the Rebetzin and amongst it was a group of names for the um, Rebbe to bench these people. And the person who took, who worked in the house, took the package and gave the flowers to the Rebetzin and left the names to give them to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe said, what are you doing? The Rebetzin is a powerful enough. She has the power of blessings and you could give it to him as uh, well. Rabbi Harlick tells a story that um, there was a Chassidah Shiyid who, who um, for whatever reason, you know, it was quite hard at times to get an appointment for Yechidis to the personal audience. Just think about this. If the Rebbe saw people towards later life when he still had Yechidis, it was twice a week. From nine in the evening, let's even say to five in the morning. Sometimes he was with people who he felt he had to be for an hour. How many people are there that could see him in a week? And everyone wanted to see him. So it was hard to get an appointment. And there was a Chassidah Shayid who they didn't want to give it uh, to uh, the, right then. And somehow word got to the Rebetzin that he's desperate for Yechidis 
and the secretaries won't give it to him. And she said, my husband cares for every person. I will ask to, 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 for him to have a yechidis. And the minute she, he, she asked, came the message from the secretariat. Obviously, she asked the Rebbe, and the Rebbe gave orders to let him into yechidis. We find that whenever the Rebbetson, so to say, asked her husband to interfere, it was always done. I remember being in um, a shul in Kingston Avenue. That was Rabbi da, uh, Don Levy. Now it's uh, Rabbi Kalman's uh, Weinstein Shul. I was there for Shabbos and they told this story that there was a, uh, a yeshiva bacher whose kvutza, his classmates were going to on shlichus to study for, for two years or so in Seattle. And they made a list of all the, the students and who should be chosen. This Bacha was not chosen. And he felt he was never chosen for anything. And he was very depressed that he was always neglected and overlooked. 770 has a, a library, uh, has an elevator. And <coughs> in that uh, lift, um, the Rebetzin was very close to her mother, obviously, and then to her sister, Rebetzin Hanagarari, who lived on the third floor. And when she would come into 770, she would take the lift to the third floor. This Bacha was in the elevator, the lift, because there was also an office for the yeshiva on the third floor. And they were both in the elevator together. And the uh, Rebetzin could see that he was very depressed. So she asked him, what's wrong? Why do you look so depressed? And he cried to her and he said, I wanted to go on Shlichus to Seattle. So many of my friends and classmates were chosen and I'm never chosen for anything. And um, the Rebetzin asked her name and I'm told that afterwards the Rebbe called the people in charge and his name was added. So they said, here is one person who the Rebetzin sent on Shlichus. There are many, many stories to, to still tell, and maybe we'll be able to, to spend another hour on it. But I'd like to, 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 to point out one of the most famous things. And you see the sacrifices that the Rebetzin made and her devotion to her husband. And that is the famous story of Didan Notzach of the Swarm of Hay Tevis, which is a discussion on its own. But the bottom line is that um, the previous Rebbe had tremendous amount of libraries, manuscripts, some are still in Russia, very valuable things. The Rebbe had three daughters, the previous Rebbe. The oldest one, Rabbi Tzinchana, was married to the Rashag, to Rabbi Gerari. Our Rabbi Tzin was married to the Rebbe, and there was a Rabbi Tzin Shena, who was married to Rabbi Mendel Hornstein. She was killed in Treblinka. And the previous Rebbe's priceless library was kept in 770. The previous Rebbe had one grandson, uh, by the name of Barry Gurari, and most people know, we, I don't have enough time to go into the whole history of Didan Notzach, but he began taking some of these priceless books and manuscripts and basically selling them for money. And word got to the Rebbe that these were being taken. And the Rebbe took it very personally and very serious. And he said that this is a challenge to the whole concept of being a Nasi, being a Rebbe and a leader. And his argument was that these things are not a Rebbe's personal things that can be inherited and divided amongst family members, but rather 
there is the Chabad Hasidim group, Agudas Hasidei Chabad. And everything that our Rebbe acquires, he acquires for the whole group and remains holy and sanctified by that group. Obviously, the, uh, this man, uh, Barry Gerari, argued, no, that it belongs to the family and uh, that I have a right to uh, whatever my mother's share is, let's say 50% of it. And uh, he refused to come to the Bethden and there was a very big lawsuit. Uh, one of the things that they said was that they'd have to make a deposition and they wanted to make a deposition of the Rebetzin. Rabbi Krinsky was very worried and very, uh, very reluctant to allow that to take place. And the Rebbe, when they discussed it with the Rebbe, he said, what do you worry about? The Rebbe can handle herself. She will come through with flying colors. And that's what happened. They had people from the court with interpreters coming to make the deposition of the Rebbe. They came into her living room and and asked her questions now in a deposition what the lawyers try and do is ask you the same questions in millions of different ways and they try to stumble you and make and make and make you confused and the one thing people have to know is that you you have to answer precisely and succinctly not use one extra word, because if you do, then they'll trap you on that. And the saying goes that if you say the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. But if you exaggerate or say something out of context, they pick up on it and they are able to, uh, to, to destroy your, your whole um, testimony. And most people, especially those people who are in it for the first time, usually stumble and get trapped. Rabbi Krinsky says it was unbelievable to watch the Rebetzin in this because <coughs> she didn't use one word extra, answer to the point. And no matter how they tried to twist and turn, she was determined and kept to her stand. Sadly, by the way, she was extremely close to her sister and they would often visit each other, etc. But as a result of this, their relationship became very strained. But the crowning point of this whole case was actually her words. Because towards the end of the deposition, the lawyer asked the Rebetzin, in your personal mind, did the library belong to your father, the Rebbe himself, or to the Hasidim? And the Rebetzin looked forward and said, there's no question in my mind that the Rebbe's library belonged to the Hasidim. The Rebbe's only possessions that he owned were his talis and tefillin. Nothing was his. And she added, and that's because not only did his possessions belong to the Hasidim, but the Rebbe himself belonged to the Hasidim. And uh, the lawyer, Rabbi Krinsky, says, threw down his, his pen in, in Atta and said, well, what's the point? That was uh, one of the deciding factors in the case that the uh, judge gave over. They point out that the Rebetzin passed away on the 22nd of Shvat, which is um, Yud Aleph. Shvat is the day that the Rebbe became Rebbe and Chov Beishvat 
is is double Yud Aleph Shvat. The Rebetzin was was not feeling well, and Dr. Feldman and another doctor came to the uh, Rebetzin to treat her, and um, the Reb was at home, and Rabbi Zalman Garari was there at all, and the doctors decided that she has to go to the hospital. Although the Rebbe wanted to go with, the Rebetzin asked him not to come. And they went to the uh, hospital, Rabbi Gurari and the doctors. In the car, going to the hospital, although many others who are not well would worry about themselves on the prognosis, Dr. Feldman had a daughter who was engaged to be married. And in that time, the Rebetzin was inquiring all about the daughter, the excitement, the engagement, the wedding that was coming up. That was what interested her the most. She came to the hospital and she was sitting there in the wheelchair. And before they could put her in the room, she asked for a glass of water she said the bracha, shahakol near bidvarai, and she passed away without drinking the water in the same way as Rebetzin Chai Mushka, the Tzamach Tzedek's wife, also passed away. There were over 15,000 people that came to the funeral. And as I say, the Rebbe, you could hear that Kaddish was totally changed. And only then, Hasidim begin to realize what a wife, what a Rebetzin, what an individual she was. You know, someone once came to her home and saw there were no pictures of children, a child, and asked her, where are your children? And the Hasidim in the world are our children. The Rebetzin in treating, in, in respecting his wife, dedicated an organization called Yad Chomesh. Chomesh stands for Chaya Mushka Schneerson. And they do tremendous religious charitable activities, giving out millions of dollars in her name. The Beis Rifke campus is called Yad Chomesh. And millions, I would imagine, of girls around the world are named after her in order to, to um, keep and perpetuate her memory. The Rebbe spoke a lot about how tzaddikim carry on living. And one of the verses he used is, that the living should take to life, that we should use her life as an inspiration. So before I conclude, I'd like to point out there are still many, many stories that I would like to tell about the Rebetzin, including how private an individual she was and how she secured her privacy, even sacrificing going to shul. So perhaps if Rabbi Mesinta allows, maybe next week we'll use some of the time to conclude with uh, stories of the Rebetzin. So, let us take her life as an inspiration to be devoted to Hasidim, to be devoted to the Rebbe, to carry on their holy work of Achayitim and Liboy, to give the tzedakah we need to, to do the learning we need to, the Mishnais, and Emir Hashem, to be see Moshiach and to be reunited with our Rebbe and Rebetzin. Thank you, a good fach. Rabbi Kolobach, you are an absolute encyclopedia. It is a privilege to listen to. Yes, next week we'll continue with the, uh, the life of the Rebetzin. I just want to mention, as I explained at the beginning of this webinar, to visit the oil of the Rebbe, to write for a broch or to write for advice, is fundamental to, to Hasidic thinking. So next week, Sunday, Rabbi Kolobach is going to be doing a virtual visit to the oil. And on anybody who would like to join, please WhatsApp Rabbi Kolobach or myself 
and uh, on Thursday, Rabbi Kolobach will do a short um, Zoom meeting just explaining the procedure. Then everybody will be asked to write in a letter. The letter will be emailed. Nobody will read the letter. It will be emailed to somebody in New York who will take in these letters. He'll print them out and take them into the OHL. And it's a very meaningful experience. We've done two before and we got uh, tremendous feedback. So anybody who'd like to join, please uh, WhatsApp Rabbi Kalabach myself. And I wish everybody a good week, a good Chodesh, a good month. And we should have the revelation of Mashiach immediately. Amen. Shkoyach.